So we have this, enter, this economy that must grow, and it's connected to this petroleum system, which we reasonably think can't grow, at least not like we've become accustomed to it. And when you think about the oil situation as we go forward, I would invite you to think about the quantity and the quality story. If the quality part is being left out of the story, one of the most important features is being left out of that story. And, you know, I don't, I've studied the energy situation so much at this point in time. I've looked at the fact that now the U.S. Department of Defense, the German military, the United, United Kingdom government have all come out with reports that basically say 2015 or before is when we're going to hit some sort of a supply versus demand mismatch and or maybe peak oil. That, economically speaking, is in the blink of an eye in terms of the implications for what we'll have to do to reform our economy, our way of life, how we transport ourselves, how we grow things, everything. All of that's potentially uh, at risk and something that we need to think about. So I don't care how much you know, lipstick you put on that particular pig, nobody is going to kiss it. <laughs> all, right, all right, this kid would, but <laughs> not my kid. And I didn't take the picture. I, I found it somewhere. All right. <coughs> So I have, a, I have a very similar story about the environment, which I want to go through very quickly. And, and Paul can have stole the punchline. But see these two gentlemen here? I mean, there's cameras around, so it can't be that long ago. They're actually sitting on a copper nugget. That's what was lying around in stream beds in this country when people first started walking around saying, what do you got? Uh, we like copper. Amazing, right? And you know what? This is how the story goes. Eventually, you run out of those really quick. Uh, and then you, that's OK. There's smaller nuggets. And then you run out of those, and that's okay. You've got this beautiful copper ore, 10%. If you can't see it from the side, it's green. It's just gorgeous stuff, right? And then eventually you run out of that, and what do you got? Well, you got this. This is the largest copper mine in the United States. It's the Bingham Canyon mine. It used to be a hill. In my part of the country, the east, we'd actually call it a mountain. Uh, and now it's a hole. It's two and a half miles across and three quarters of a mile deep. And we are chasing copper there right now that is 0.2% in total ore grade. And so imagine that. You're all the way at the bottom, three quarters of a mile down, and you have to dig up 500 pounds of ore, truck it three quarters of a mile up, bring it over, smash it, leach it, refine it, smelt it to get a single pound of copper. We're not doing that because we like to give engineers challenges. That's what's left after 150 years of industrialization. What does the next 150 years look like? Is it just more, more, more? Or can we imagine there's some deflection in the story? But I invite you again to not imagine the cost of copper. Prices give bad information sometimes. Think about the energy that's contained. That you, when you look at that hole, think of the energy that it took to dig that and make that. That's the important part of this story. And of course, we can go across a bunch of other um, things. This is a study done by a, a, a professor out of, out of Italy. He was looking at, asked the question, um, of all the known reserves of various elements, if we continue to grow our extraction with them at 2%, which has been our, what we've been doing for the past 20 years, um, how long do we have before we actually run out of these things? And here's some that I've circled that happen to have less than 15 years of known reserves left. So we've got strontium, we've got silver, uh, antimony, gold, zinc. These are some pretty important elements. Not all of them are substitutable. Some of them you can substitute a little bit, but oh gosh, we keep going out. And we can see that we've got not another 150 years, in many cases, we've got a couple of decades. And the assumption in this chart is that we will have sufficient energy and willpower to go after these particular reserves, because all of them are facing that same general story of becoming more dilute, a little bit deeper, uh, a little bit more diffuse as we go through it. Is that 2% population growth no, no. or GDP? No, no, that's, that's extracting the reserve. So if we, if we pulled out a million pounds of copper this year, 2% more would be a million and 2%, right? Another, another 20,000. In the amounts. In the amounts, correct. Yep, thanks for the clarification. So here, if we think about a generalized resource extraction profile, the big green, you know, giant nuggets of copper, and then the littler ones, and then the less and the more diffuse, and then all the way down at the end, you're, you're digging up holes in the ground that are three quarters of a mile deep. And just like anything, you, you run through a curve where you get more and more, and then you get slightly less and less out. But what's really important in this story is that the energy that's required to go after those things does not go up linearly. It goes up exponentially or non-linearly, depending on how you want to look at it. And of course, you know, we could talk about the cost. The cost just sort of follows along. It's just sort of an addendum to this story. Um, and so now, when I look at this, I say, OK, so we've got this economy that must grow by its very design, or it's really unhappy, uh, and is connected to an energy system that really can't grow. 
And we can look through our windshield, at least in my adult lifetime, certainly within my children's lifetime, and look at the environment and say, gosh, look at all that depleting stuff. And they're all tied together. Two of these things are based on real things out of the world, and one of these things is a human construct. So, you know, when push comes to shove, the question to ask is, is which wins? And in the resource story, quantity and quality, I don't care if somebody says there's a 40, 100 million billion tons of copper left. I want to know the quality of that. Is it 0.001%? I agree. You know, seawater. Look at all the copper in seawater. There's a lot, right? But we're probably not going to get to it. And so the general story is one of this where, for the longest time, we've been able to count on having more and more and more resources. And we built an entire economic model, institutions, social arrangements, where we live, have all been predicated on that always remaining true. And we can now start to see a question of maybe resources going down at some point in the future. Not that long. If it's oil, it might actually be only in the next four or five years if it hasn't started already. And through all of that, we've got this money system that's been growing and needs to grow. And by money, I actually mean debt. They're interchangeable terms when you loan all your money into existence, right? That we've got a money system that needs to grow exponentially. And so when I said debt is a claim on money, the important question as well is what's money a claim on? Well, primary wealth is the original form of wealth. That is your concentrated copper ores. That is concentrated uh, energy sources. That's what the abundance of the earth had to offer us. Secondary wealth is when somebody takes that ore and smelts it and turns it into iron and brings it to market, goes to the rich fishing grounds and brings fish to the plate. Tertiary or third order wealth is all the abstractions we put on top of that, by which I mean stocks, bonds, money, but let's make no mistake about this. Without primary wealth, you can't have secondary wealth. And without secondary wealth, tertiary wealth has no meaning whatsoever. So the question now becomes, if we understand that, what happens when we can reasonably predict that that primary and secondary wealth are going to start shrinking down a little bit? What happens then? I wish I could answer that because uh, it would be a very, you know, that would be great. I'd be an actual futurist then instead of a guy who got lucky once or twice. Um, but we don't know, because our economy is a complex system. It's a very complex system. But even though we can't tell you exactly what's going to happen and when, we know some things. Like, like I can't predict uh, when a wave crashes on the shore all the eddies and flows and where the foam is going to go. I can't predict any of that. Nobody can. But I can tell you that that wave, given the parameters of the situation, isn't going to get to be 100 feet tall, right? In, you know, if the other average wave is maybe three feet in height. So we know some things about these things. And one of the things we know is that complex systems that grow require energy to maintain their order. And that when you withdraw energy, in particular, complexity shrinks. That's a loaded statement. When I say complexity shrinks, think about how many job classifications we had in 1900, how many we have today. Now we're going to start shrinking those back down. Everything that I would predict in terms of, and I have predicted, about what's happening in the economy, looking through this energy and resource lens, fits with what we know. We're dumping money in as fast as we can, but the jobs aren't coming back and things just aren't working. Why could that be? Well, maybe we haven't dumped enough money or we have the wrong policies. That's one possibility. The other is, is that we have less available resources flowing into our economy at this point in time and that the outcomes we're seeing are all predicted on the basis of that. So when I look into the future, I see some very fundamental economic challenges, really powerful ones that are going to be very difficult to dig out from under, even if we only had one E to worry about. You know, I diagnosed the whole problem that we had in our economy as three words, too much debt. We'd taken on too much debt. Well, even if that was all we were facing, I think we'd have a pretty tall order, as we heard over a keynote speech and lunch, that, that we've, got, we've got some issues that are going to take a while to dig out from under. But what happens is we're trying to dig out from under that is we start throwing additional strains onto that system. What happens then? What happens when we start having some uh, issues around peak oil and what all of that means? And so, you know, in the context of this particular story of population of immigration, what occurs to me is to think, you know, we have enough going on at this point in time. One possible framing that's near term, urgent, would capture some attention, is to ask this question. Wouldn't it make sense at this point in time to try and minimize all of the additional expenses we might think about at this time? We might have to really focus our resources, we might have to really prioritize. If peak oil is real, and it's coming in three or four years, we have trillions of dollars of expenditures to get our company, country and our, many of our companies in line with that reality. Where we live, how we transport things, 
all kinds of things have to be refashioned. They're fantastic investments to make, but that mean those investments are monies we won't have to do other things with. So I think we're just coming up to the point, instead of saying we want everything and, we're going to have to start making real prioritized decisions about what we choose to spend our money on. And we may have to enter triage mode if it breaks fast enough. So that's my particular story right there. And um, I know I did it very quickly, but I just wanted to thank you for that. And if you want to hear more, go to the crash course at my website, and the whole story is there.